Hello, welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 82. I'm John Ferry with Dave Vellante. Salute, Dave. Good seeing you. Johnny Boy, good seeing you, my man. What's happening? I'm in Seattle at AWS's headquarters, reInvent. I'm in my room doing late checkout Friday. So I'm going to get. Uh, I'm going to go back to interview um, Deepak Singh, who heads up all their Q uh, workflow for developers. Had Matt Garman this morning. Had Swami, um, Dilip, who runs Q for business, and just rocking and rolling here and getting exclusives for reInvent. Obviously, Gen AI is hot, Dave. Agentic Systems might be on the agenda this year, and of course, expect. Um, some semiconductor news as well. And uh, SageMaker is lowering in the stack as considered media infrastructure, as we heard uh, them publicly kind of describe. So you see, you see the role of SageMaker and Bedrock chime out. But yeah, we can get into a lot of that stuff. I really can't say a lot because I'm kind of embargoed. Um, but, you know, they're talking about, you know, their ecosystem, like the Databricks of the world who are really doing well with serverless, model integration, Anthropic, um, big news this week on Cisco had some earnings, um, you know, FTC probe into Microsoft. You saw Meta got hit with a huge fine um, as well. And again, the agents are hot. It's the new shiny new toy and uh, it's rocking and rolling. So, I mean, I don't know where you want to start. I mean, <laughs> what do you got going on? <laughs> yeah, I was at, uh, I was in Arizona this week at the Veeam analyst meeting, uh, my first physical one. I've done virtual stuff before too. And of course we've done Veeam on a number of times. I can't say anything either uh, because it was the whole session was NDA, deep dives on product and business. Uh, and I think there's some exciting um, developments that are happening that are gonna unfold before the end of the year, I think. And uh, so that's where I was in the Valley of the Sun. It was, you know, great weather and good conversation. And that's about all I can say there. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been working on just more detail in the cloud market. Would love to talk about that today. Um, what's happening with the IPO market. I mean, the, 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 the 10 year is popping up again. Uh, Jeremy Siegel, I was just listening to him. He says it's going to hit five by next year which is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, at the same time, you're going to have, you know, the Trump tax cuts from 2017 are going to continue. So maybe that's a good thing, but you know, I'm hearing that 2025 might still be a soft market for IPO. You saw the Databricks news where Databricks is doing a, you know, private, another private round to delay its IPO, I guess. And Databricks is kicking ass. All the ETR survey data shows that they're really, yeah. you know, vaulting. It was supposedly a $55 billion valuation that would put them $10 billion or more above snowflake john which would be you know yeah. amazing can't wait till those guys go public and we can dig into their numbers yeah i mean they may never go public we'll see you know well, who knows i mean databricks is just i mean the data lake and the data layer is going through such great transformation and you know seeing how how amazon web services has got reinvent teed up this is all about it, this Cambrian explosion of apps coming. And, um, you know, harmonization is a key word. You know, I, I was talking on the Cube today, you know, infrastructure as code, you know, created the DevOps movement, right? You know, and that was what APIs did. And so, you know, I, I was talking about business as code and starting to lay out that framework, Dave. What does business as, business as code mean? So, you know, um, you know, this is... This is a really big discussion around the future, right? So mm -hmm. you get business as code, and that's essentially going to bring a DevOps-like methodology to business applications when you know, you got productivity empowering workers to write their own SQL by saying to an LLM or a AI tool, write me a SQL query that does the following. Find me sales by month for the next five years, <laughs> and then just gives a SQL query fits out the code and you just type it yourself or execute it. Um, that is a game changer and it's creating harmony between people. The relationship with people is changing. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm observing in, in my interactions with customers using AI is that business people and that friction between the other departments, like, hey, can you write and get me that report? You know, or it, it goes away, it changes. You're starting to see a lot more Harmony, hey, a lot of people collaborating. Like it's easier when you remove friction in work, 
AI is creating these these derivative benefits, right? And so I wrote a story about this two days ago when I interviewed Werner Vogels about the implications of Lambda, which is, we all know in the cloud world, in, enabled serverless. Um, the, their entire world changed because a lot of the, 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 the hassles around configuring the, the EC2s and all these servers basically went away. And now companies like Databricks announced their last show that they're all serverless, right? So what serverless did for the infrastructure, you're going to start to see AI do for productivity. You don't yet know what you don't know until you start doing it, right? So I think this business as code concept is going to change the deployment of applications um, and and give uh, this agentic layer some programmability to it, like DevOps did, Dave. So remember, DevOps was, was a dream scenario and created the cloud. And a lot really? of things... A lot of things happened under the covers. Virtualization was a key part of that. Nitro with Amazon. Then you got Annapurna. So you had all these pro progressions of value, innovation value, that actually enabled the entire movement. And I think that's what's happening with generative AI as I squint through all these briefings and look, talk to all the people and uh, get briefed on all the news and look at the customer deployments. The rubber is meeting the road with the use cases that have value. And we're in a post ZERP era. So startups are actually focused in on value like that too. So it's interesting dynamic right now in the market. And I got to say, it feels like the nineties, if you're an infrastructure player, because networking's hot, compute is hot, everything's hot. And if you're on the app side, you'll feel like you're writing your, you know, PC apps. It's like exciting there too. So no matter what, who you are, it's a, it's a tech party, Dave. It's a, it's like, everyone's loving this. Uh, now, <laughs> certainly the exuberance is high and people are stoked, but there's real, real shit happening, like really cool stuff. And so, you know, people get lost in the weeds sometimes, but if you zoom out and you look at the the the, the trees in, in the forest blowing, you can see the trends. And then, you know, you can go down to the tree level and look at the bark, you know, bark from bark on the tree and the tree in the forest, you know, there's a big picture. And the big picture is, is that we're gonna see a wave of economic gain and productivity that we've never seen before. We we alluded to that in the last podcast, but it's a tech party right now. I mean, it really is. I mean, look at the numbers. Funding's up. IPOs are going to come out. The cloud guys are going to probably do a lot more revenue. I mean, I like AWS and their 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 Tranium chips going to come out, and you're going to see that. Um, you're going to see Anthropic tied to that performance, and then you know you've got Microsoft trying to build nuclear reactors. I mean, the game is on. CapEx, it's just, it's just an exciting time if you're in the tech business, whether you're a player or a commentator. Um, he's got all these new tools. And Swami, who runs the AI group, who you know literally built RDS, built DynamoDB, he's been a database guy. He's like, John, literally what took weeks and months before doing in days and minutes, hours now. So yeah. it's just a game changer. And that's the, I mean, biz, business is code is a kind of really interesting catchphrase i like to unpack that a little bit i mean what you're describing that last comment you made about swami and you know you've heard people talk about this the all-in guys talk, used to talk about it all the time you know basically being able to do with one-tenth the people that you have today on staff um and which would be you know amazing productivity driver as you say but that idea of business is code it's essentially automating all those unautomated processes that we haven't been able to automate and I, we talked about this last week, the top down and sort of bottoms up productivity boom. But there's a lot of things that you, you alluded to, like under the hood that have to happen in order for this to take place. So, you know, technically you've got to turn st strings that databases understand into things that are represent a business, the digital representation of a business, people, places, and things. And, you know, the goods, the the logistics, the the humans, et cetera. And, the, yeah. and, and being able to incorporate the processes as well is really important. You mentioned the harmonization that what, what, what you're referring to there is being able to take all these different data types, disparate data, structured data, unstructured data, JSON data, SQL data, graph data, and being able to harmonize it such that it can be transformed from strings into things and be a digital representation of a business in, in real time. And then the other thing is the agents have to be able to learn from the reasoning traces of humans. We've talked about this before, and there needs to be technology to enable that. And there needs to be an agent control framework that can be governed. And so all this stuff underneath 
has to happen in order for that vision to take place. But I think, I think it's going to happen. I personally, I think it's going to take the better part of a decade to unfold because we're talking about processes. We're talking about people. We're talking about change management, but it's going to happen in steps. And there's going to be a lot of things that we can do in the near term that we can automate uh, that are going to drive, you know, an initial wave of productivity. And then I think you're going to see a massive step function toward the end of the decade, which is going to completely transform industries. Yeah. And I like AWS as a, as a, as a, as an example, because one, you know, I'm talking to them today and they got the conference coming up, you get supercomputing happening. We just had KubeCon this week. So you're seeing these shows line up. These are three, these are three important shows in our world because they, they will set the agenda for the next year. We're in this reality mode, hype, hype cycle's gone. We're in the reality cycle of show me the money, show me the value. And so cloud natives, the developer hoodie crowd, obviously cloud native services like Kubernetes. And then you got supercomputing, which is like the horsepower, what's NVIDIA doing, what's Core Weave doing, all these, what's all these hardware guys doing. Um, and then you got reInvent, obviously uh, it's a bellwether. And you have the, 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 the new stacks emerging, the Gen AI stacks. And what's happening is, is that it's just another layer of an innovation, Dave. And that's why I said it looks like the 90s and some layers, like the old days, networking and compute, when chips were coming out from Intel and networking gear was faster. And then you have the applications getting smarter. The same thing's happening here. And if you look at AWS, for example, they have huge growth in their core services, EC2, S3. So it's not like, you know, storage networking and compute's going away. It's only getting, has to get better. So they're still gonna make money on that. Um, and the applications that are being built are going to take advantage of those services, but have new capabilities that are transformative for the enterprise, like impacting the day-to-day -day workflows, right? So Amazon Q, for instance, is, is their thing, and other people have other products. Glean's out there on the Google Cloud. And then the ecosystems are changing where partnerships, whether it's at the chip level, NVIDIA's a partner and customer of AWS, as well as um, a frenemy, basically, an enemy and a friend. So um, as they say, frenemy. Um, and then you got, at the end of the day, the investment that companies have to make in the infrastructure, whether that's using cloud or whatever, the costs. And at the end of the day, security is has to be built in. So you got all these things. It's very challenging for customers, but it's a huge opportunity in the enterprise. So, you know, your your post that you wrote last week, I thought was phenomenal around um, uh, Jamie Dimon being Sam Altman's biggest competitor, pointing out the obvious that the enterprises have a lot of their own data where JP Morgan and JP Morgan Chase by the way, have huge amounts of data. And then, so what are they going to do? They're going to stand up their own clusters. Do they use the cloud? And so, you know, they're going to have to spend some money as well. So they have a CapEx challenge. So, you know, the cloud guys will end up win, winning because the developer ecosystem is ro ro rolling. Amazon's growth and positioning, as well as Microsoft, Google, Oracle, and others, is going to be great. They're going to win. Everybody wins. Yeah. Party, Dave. And I know you're so covering this. why I want to tee it up because, like, the, in the tech party, everybody's winning. Well, a couple of things on that, John. First of all, I think, you know, that point you made about, you know, Jamie Dimon is Sam Altman's biggest competitor, the post that George and I wrote. You know, uh, if you look at the market right now, the Dells, the HPEs, Lenovo's, you know, they're 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 doing very well with their AI servers. But those AI servers are mostly, in my view anyway, going to the big five LLM vendors and the training companies and the service providers. That's where it's going today. We, we haven't seen you know, the so-called repatriation hit. You hear it a lot from the vendor community, but my guess is it's still, you know, low to mid single digits of the spend that's actually getting, you know, repatriated. The The cloud business uh, is is huge. In fact, Brendan, if you could bring up the slide, that our, the Cube Research estimates that 2024, the IaaS and PaaS revenue is almost $300 billion. And you can see AWS is, is the biggest, followed by Microsoft, Google, and you know Alibaba. But we've added we've added granularity to this. You can see Oracle. Oracle is really hot right now. I mean, they're growing like crazy, you know, 30, 40, 50% in IaaS and PaaS. And then we've added some of the, the, uh, the Chinese manufacturers. Obviously, IBM still got a cloud. But what's interesting here, John, to your point, a huge opportunity. If you look at the overall cloud market beyond just the IaaS and PaaS, if you think about the the IT spending is probably about five billion dollars a year, and about two thirds of that is internal, you know, spend like on staff. So, so you take out, you know, all but a couple billion. Uh, it's, you know, three billion is probably on internal. So you got two billion, and probably about forty percent of that is 
uh, is cloud. You know, we're talking now about IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, and cloud professional cloud services. And and by 2025, that's going to be a trillion dollar market. And you can see here on this chart that Microsoft is actually the biggest player at 150 billion. AWS only competes really in the IaaS and PaaS business over 100 billion dollars this year. So thank you, Brendan. The point is, John, that that's a big opportunity for AWS if they choose to take it. You know, you and I and Jerry Chen back in I think 2013 were on the cube at reInvent. And Jerry Chen at the time, uh, and I think he's proven right, said, I don't think Amazon's going to go hard after the SaaS business. Rather, they're going to provi pro provide tools and services for their partners and customers to build SaaS applications. That's exactly what happened. Snowflake runs on AWS. Salesforce runs on AWS. Increasingly, they're running on Azure and Google as well. So the question I have for you, John, is will a AWS get into the SaaS business? Do they have to get into the SaaS business? I know Q is kind of their play there, but it's still small and it's very tools oriented. What do you think? I mean, it's a tough call. And I think Amazon has that view of their ecosystem that's been you know, critical. Amazon has had a culture of partnering, right? And Nat Garman brought this up today in my interview with him. But they also have the, the view of if they have expertise, they'll do it themselves. Remember how Amazon Web Services was born? They were was born out of their own needs, right? They built their own, they said, we have our own data center, why don't we just make it for other people? So I'm oversimplifying, but that's essentially what happened. It so is. Yeah. If you look at COVID, okay, and this is very interesting. During COVID, one of the hottest products for AWS was the, um, the Connect product, which is essentially the call center as a service. And they have they have huge expertise in this. You know, they got a retail operation, they have all the inbound logistics, they manage supply chain. So, you know, during COVID, two things jumped out at everybody. What, you know, no one forecasted a disruption where everybody works at home, right? That was a problem. So you had office work problems, but it, the supply chain was a big problem. If you remember at that time, supply chain getting stuff. I mean, we all had experienced stuff with the cars. Oh, they oh, got the new cars, you're waiting for that chip. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's all there. The car's built, it's just waiting for that one little chip so you can't sell it. So, you know, people who were in the car looking for cars at that time, and we saw this everywhere. There's always a component missing, right? Supply chain, call centers, these are core competencies for AWS and they went direct. Now, what's different is nobody could build that. I mean, you're not going to see like a Dropbox. You're like, hey, I'm going to build a call center. Um, so you're starting to see these areas where scale gives you size, advantage to do things that nobody else do because you're seeing things at scale. I called that a while back. I actually talked about this with Matt Garman in August uh, when he was, came on exclusive with theCUBE was scalable apps. And there was a new category, and I've talked about this on the pod before, a new category of apps where their their only work at scale, indexing the biosphere is a huge climate change technical problem now available because of supercomputing is available for the masses. So you got these new use cases that are at scale, the application. And so only hyperscalers like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, and Microsoft can do that because they have the scale. They've seen problems that the non-scaled sites or data centers don't see because they're not scaled. So, so I think you're going to start to see Amazon look at areas where they're really strong in. What are they strong in? They're strong in retail. They're strong in cloud. They're strong in telecom now with satellites. They're strong with these areas. So I would not be surprised if you saw as a service cloud-like consumption and delivery be rolled out as a core service for Amazon. Well, well, what about the ecosystem? Well, you know, Snowflake's not going to build that, something huge. Maybe they will, but it's going to take too long, right? So I think there's an, an element where you can have the cake and eat it too for AWS, where they can have the ecosystem do it because Amazon has experience on the retail side with sellers. And essentially the ecosystem of AWS are sellers. They have a marketplace and they sell stuff on top of AWS as, as well as being hosted. So, so they're hosting and selling. So if you can give someone distribution and profits, I don't think the ecosystem is going to care if there's some sort of quasi coopetition or the fact that they start selling high-end valuable SaaS apps or cloud apps that only they could deliver. And then the ecosystem will basically evolve. Now, you know, people might be dogmatic with, with these moves, but I expect Amazon to do that. And they have a leader to do that, um, head up solutions. 
Her name is Colleen Aud Aud Audrey. I interviewed her, Audrey, she, and I interviewed her this week. So her job yeah. is to build all these solutions. They have a whole group dedicated to this. Leadership, product teams, to look at these areas where Amazon specifically internally have solved things for themselves and can bring it at scale to the market. Great points. I, I would. That's where they're starting. They're already great. Doing it. Great analysis. I mean, the, to me, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm, I don't think Amazon it would make any sense for them to go try to compete with whatever Salesforce or Workday and these horizontal apps. We talked about this last week. I think the real big long tail, the huge opportunities to automate all that un unautomated stuff inside of the enterprise and being able to apply Amazon tooling to proprietary data and take their learnings from their own uh, applications that they've built uh, and, and enabled, whether it's supply chain or logistics, all the stuff they're doing with planning and warehousing. And, you know, Amazon's just a phenomenal, Amazon retail, just a phenomenal operation. And they have so much internal IP that they could leverage and build solutions. I guess you'd call them apps maybe a redefining SaaS. Yeah. So not traditional SaaS, what you're yes. talking about. You're talking yeah. about a, an entirely new way to think about automation. Let's just face it. That's what, that's what commercial off the shelf software does. It automates things. We've automated human resource management and Salesforce automation and, yeah. you know, all these horizontal apps. And there's been some vertical industry applications as well and, and, and custom stuff, but the vast majority of business processes are unautomated and that's where Amazon could really drive, you know, literally it's a, it's a multi-trillion dollar market. Yeah. And, and to your point about Microsoft leading in terms of um, on the share, cause they have their own large SaaS business. That's a really great example of the old way. So for example, it works because they have a cloud, essentially their data centers that run their office suite. Basically we all know what that is. Word, Word, PowerPoint, Teams, that SaaS business, what it means from Microsoft from a revenue standpoint, although old school and tailored to them, Amazon has that opportunity. To your point, it's not about them building Word, okay? It's not about Amazon saying, we're going to have Word. That's like looking at the bark of the tree and saying, we should copy Microsoft. No, no, I don't think that's the case. None of the leaders are thinking like that. They're thinking, we don't, why would we do that? Or Word already exists. Maybe AI right. will create a Word version, but they're thinking about what the new apps are going to be. Working backwards from the customer, they have this uh, concept. Remember Andy Jassy, what, I forget which reInvent it was. It might have been his last reInvent. He did that master class on stage where he explained the customer innovation equation, the working backwards document. And it was mm -hmm. almost like a master class. Here's how you do customer-driven innovation. He was such a visionary that that's actually in play right now because what the cloud does with Gen AI for customers, to your point about process, is it makes the customers control their own destiny around creating their own, you know, internally driven innovation strategy using their own customer feedback loops. That's why your JP uh, uh, Morgan and Chase example with Jamie Dimon is perfect. They already have their own customers and they have data, right? So it's about them building the app. So if Amazon can provide JP Morgan Chase, and they're a customer of Amazon, as I found out today, with the apps that serve their customer's customer, meaning JP Morgan's Chase's customer, then that SaaS app is JP Morgan's app. So that's a whole nother level. This is like why the working backwards document, why Werner was talking about with me this week on the exclusive I had with them. I mean, this is the week of exclusives. It's great for us. But his point was Lambda created value because they solved a problem. There was no blueprint for what it would be or do, but it ended up spawning innovation. That's the enterprise opportunity. And I think that's what AWS is going to do. And the tell signs are already there. The markers have been laid down. Um, you know, Colleen is leading the effort. She's been with Amazon for years. She built that ad business up. She is super smart. And what she's doing is really right. She's are very focused on where they have value today, like Connect. Connect saved people's butts there and during COVID. Um, getting um, fielding support calls during COVID. Everyone was calling, how do I get my, my check? How do I get my, 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 my check from the government? Even governments loved Amazon. And that was, you know, rare to see. So public sector grew, every category grew. So, 
you know, Amazon can build that SaaS business without foreclosing and compromising any growth with the current ecosystem. Period. Yeah, and and I I don't even want to call it SaaS because to your point, it's a completely different thing. And by the way, I want to just bring up something. So a, several Q pods ago, uh, Sanjeev Mohan, our friend, emailed us and said, "Hey, I was listening to your uh, commentary on Amazon because you guys sound really bullish. Did you see the uh, the letter, the open letter to Amazon, the Amazon board by?" Yeah. Blue Duck Capital, we call them Lame Duck Capital. I just want to get, share something with you. In that letter, they, which we said was they basically looking for give us your money, but they said that since Jassy took over as CEO, the stock was only up seven percent. Well, guess what? So, so Jassy took over like July fourth, you know, of twenty twenty one, right, right at the peak. It's now up fifteen percent. So it's it's more than doubled since that 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 letter went out and. If you think about it, we talked about this last cube pod, so I don't want to rat hole too much on it, but but interest rates started going up. The IT IT business was over rotated during COVID, so people started tightening up. And 2022 was not a great year for IT spending. So it's then bottomed. It bottomed at the end of 2022, December 22. If you go back to December 2022, Amazon's up 140% since then. And we shared last week some of the comps in that lame duck capital letter, and Amazon is up you know, ahead of all of them, except I think just, except Meta and who knows, maybe up over, over Meta now. Um, it wasn't as high, high as Costco and Walmart, but okay. But so anyway, the point is that Amazon's in a really good position and, and yet they have a lot of cleaning up to do and a lot of upside and they got the right person at the helm, in my opinion. Yeah, no doubt about it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, what I'm going into supercomputing next week is looking at, you know, what hardware is going to power this Gener AI stack. And, and then and then squinting through who how differentiations emerged because everyone now can build their own apps whether it's customer driven innovation at the at the enterprise side or even Amazon building their own innovation strategies the cost and the efficiency whether it's from an energy perspective and chip price performance they're going to need to essentially manage that cost because we all know that if you want to leave these services on training all this data set and go, whoa, what's the bill? And then scaling it and security. Right now, the biggest problem we're seeing become people are working on is that they get a proof of concept, they get some wins with gender AI, and then they go, okay, great. How do we scale this? It's not the same. And what's coming very fast, and, and we pointed this out on our Cube research uh, months ago, is that multiple agents are going to be part of the model, and you're going to start to see distributed AI models. You're going to see multi-agent systems come quickly that's now far out in the horizon, and you're going to start to see applications start to have interaction relationships between models, foundation models, whether it's computer vision or text or other systems, semi-constructured, structured data, unstructured data. All of this is going to be integrated so it's seamless and frictionless. Okay, this is the next wave. This is why Databricks is up up so high. So, you know, um, you know, as these, uh, you know, lame duck capitals of the world try to squint through and challenge the report, and there's tons of upside for AWS, right? So, I mean, never mind the Gen AI revenue when you know these chips get better faster, and you can put, start putting in complex systems, stand up some of these complex clusters via the console. I mean, I was talking with David Brown about capacity blocks, which they announced. You literally could design a supercomputer and then stand it up on AWS and put guardrails in place for costs. This will power massive growth because they're going to drive price performance down just like Moore's Law did in the old days. So, you know, who wins, Dave? Startups and developer ecosystems, all right? Because if they can get this bedrock right and, and make SageMaker more of an infrastructure piece, which they're doing, it's a great opportunity. And then you know, companies like OpenAI will have to build their own cloud because if Microsoft doesn't have the juice, then you start looking at more separation on your market share slide. So, you know, I think that market share slide shows why Microsoft stock is so valuable because they've taken share in the cloud, mostly driven by their apps. Um, don't count Google out either because Google can just stand up compute too and target these big app, crazy applications that are coming online. So, you know, Multi-agent systems are evolving, secure, security is being built in, Kubernetes is getting boring as an orchestrator. Um, it's really interesting, right? So took the I, words out of my mouth, game. John. It's a tech party. Everyone, it's took, party time in technology up and down took, the stack. Took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, as much as the opportunity is massive 
for AWS or Amazon, you know, specifically, like you said, don't count Google out, don't count Microsoft out. They also have a huge opportunity as does Meta as by the way, as do these large companies like Dell, JP Morgan, Chase, uh, 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 HPE to the extent that they can apply this stuff, this AI, this automation internally and yeah. essentially teach their customers how to, how to go forward and build solutions around it. Now, are yeah. Dell and HPE and Lenovo, are they going to write software? Maybe, you know, probably not, you know, Dell, for instance, they went down the road of kind of trying to be a quasi software company when they moved into enterprise. So I think they're probably happy in their infrastructure space. Amazon certainly could do it. Microsoft unquestionably can do it and maybe have has even a bigger opportunity than, and then it and same with Google. It's just a matter of executing. And we know that Amazon can execute. And so, you know, it's like I said, this double whammy to me, it's, it's like the internet where if you, if you wanted to take advantage of it, like Michael Dell did, you could. And I just think to the extent these big companies are applying AI and automation internally, that's going to give them a big win as they point that at their customers. You know, the, the thing about the, the um, this market is transparency is critical. And, you know, we were riffing last night. Um, I was had some interviews, not on camera, but Amazon senior people. And I said, you know, they asked me, you know, you know, about the cloud stuff. I said, you know, we, you know, it's been great. You know, Dave and I talk about this on the pod all the time. You know, the critical moments in Amazon's history or web services history was, you know, the role of virtualization. You know, they saw that differently. That turned into Nitro, how James Hamilton and team and Peter DeSantis, they built a killer environment to scale up the large servers that they had stacking and racking them. And then you had the, um, the CIA moment, right? Remember when IBM, um, uh, the court yeah. ruling, that opened Judge up. Wheeler. Judge, Judge Wheeler, Wheeler Judge eviscerated Wheeler. the- That changed the game for AWS. If you remember that time, we were all over it, actually. We were like, look at this, this is great. So, so data came out and then everyone's like, wow, Amazon's better than uh, everyone else. That changed the game for Amazon right that moment. And then continuing, you saw other moments, Annapurna acquisition. You and I talk about this all the time. VMware and Annapurna are probably the best M&A deals in, in, in history of the tech business, value-wise. And then now you got Gen AI, right? So as a, as a potential game changer. So I bring this up, Dave, because you, know, you and I talk about transparency and you have to squint through the numbers. You have the best market share reports, by the way. I'm you know, saying bias, but I think it's true. I think no one has the better market share numbers on the cloud than you do. But and Microsoft numbers, I'm suspect because... You know, my rant here is that transparency reporting is really important for people to understand the health of a business, just like being an IPO company, right? So Amazon opened up that reporting. Um, that was another critical moment when they broke out the reporting. I think it was 2013, Dave, was around there. They started breaking out their mm -hmm. AWS numbers. And they've been true to their numbers. Got to give them credit on that. Microsoft hasn't. They've been hiding the ball and basically, in my words, lying to the market by changing the game. So I'd like to see Microsoft become more uh, transparent in how it's reporting its revenue uh, and performance metrics, because, you know, we don't know what's in SaaS. I mean, they say what's in there, or maybe we do, but they should be more consistent with their, so we can understand well, what Microsoft's doing. Well, but, hang on, you know, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So thank you, say, by the way. I shouldn't, I, say I, I shouldn't say they're lying, but you know, but, then it just seems like Microsoft's hiding the ball. Well, wait. So, well, okay. So let me just say this. <clears throat> thank you, by the way, for the compliment. I don't know if they're the the, the most comprehensive cloud numbers. I, I don't. Others do. But I will tell you this. I think I have. I think we have the the cube research, and and I you know spearhead this. I think we have the best handle on Microsoft's actual IaaS and PaaS numbers. We, I think. You know, we're on it. We were closer before the leak of the 34 billion from the Activision uh, uh, lawsuit. And as well, we, I think, had already adjusted our numbers to reflect uh, a more apples to apples view prior to Microsoft changing its most recent change in its Azure reporting. I believe it did the, the recent change because it was, it said because it wanted to make it easier to do comparisons. Well, if it wanted to make it easier to do comparisons, they just tell us what the Azure number is, but they don't. They only give us Azure growth rates. Their real motivation, in my opinion, was to jack up the growth rates because what they did is they took out some legacy, slow, slower growth products, which just happened to be antithetical to the apples to apples IS pass, you know, comparison. So they took those out and they inserted in so with, with, by taking those out, it lowered Azure revenue. We've talked about this as a result, it increased the growth rates. And then they 
also began reporting the AI contribution of Azure, Azure, it lifted that up. So those are the games that that Microsoft is playing. But I don't blame them, John. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to why would they report IS and PaaS only? I mean, because that's going to make them look in you know second place. Whereas if they can report their overall cloud numbers, they're 150 versus 100. You know, with with uh, with AWS. So I think they all play those games. I mean, M Amazon Web Services. They don't really give much guidance. They tell you what the the number is, and they tell you what their operating profit is, you know. But they don't give any kind of granularity between IaaS and PaaS and and SaaS and services, and you know they they kind of hide that as well. It's just one big blob, and that's fine. It leaves analysts like me to figure that out. And then Google the same. Google doesn't give a GCP number. Google talks about growth rates of its overall cloud, and then it talks about GCP relative to the overall cloud, sometimes it'll give guidance like, oh yeah, GCP grew significantly faster than our overall cloud business. Okay. What was that? A point faster, two points faster, 10 points faster, 20 points faster. You don't really ever know. So you, you're sort of left to your own investigation. So they all do it. Oracle does it. They just changed their, their reporting a, a while back. And of course now they're kicking ass. So they're happy to talk about it. IBM used to have the, the, the worst kitchen sink cloud number under Ginny Rometty. You know, they've cleaned up their reporting a little bit, but it's still, you know, I don't know how much of that is hybrid cloud versus public cloud versus, you know, edge cloud. So they all do it. I don't blame them, but this is why this is why the world needs analysts to go through and <laughs> pick a, pick the numbers apart and then come up with your best estimates. Yeah, that's the key. That's what you guys do. Well, Dave, I have to keep it short today. I wish I could go longer. Um, do it. I got a monster podcast coming out of this meeting here. Um, coming out from the Amazon trip, I got five exclusive videos um, from the Matt Garman, the CEO of AWS. Tried to get Jassy; he's not available to come on camera. He's going to be at Reinvent, though. He said he might be interested, so maybe Andy Jassy will be at Reinvent, uh, preparing for supercomputing. But I got to go back and, and interview uh, Deepak Singh, who heads up. You know, we know him. He's done a lot of the open source stuff, the container stuff. He's also heavy in the the uh, queue for developers, which is the code um, code stuff for helping code assist, which is also doing a lot of migrations. We're gonna hear a lot about legacy migration modernization. They call it legacy modernization, Dave, which is code words for moving off the old stuff. Right? Uh, uh, just real quick, Bitcoin holding over 90,000. Kathy Wood said it would today said, you know, she's by the end of the decade, she expects her base case is 500,000 for Bitcoin, you know, up, up to 650,000. So, yeah, Bitcoin looks like it's headed to a hundred thousand. You know, if it can hold here, so that's yeah. kind of interesting to watch. And uh, Cisco announced uh, eh, kind of a meh quarter. AMD layoffs. Uh, but they say they want to focus on uh, on AI. I think it's same as as Intel. They're 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 diverting resources away from the x86, which is you know kind of in a downward spiral. Coreweave, big twenty three billion dollar valuation. Um, yeah. That's amazing. A core weave. Wow. 23 billion. Yeah. That's going to be great to, to see how they maintain that valuation. They need to pour some revenue in quick. This, we're going to dig into that at supercomputing as well. So, you know, the transformation is happening, Dave. It's AI transformation. It's, it's, it's a tech party. Everyone's, everyone's having a good time. It's a tech, it's tech party time. And, uh, you know, it's great, great for everybody, including us covering it, analysts and media and, you know, digging in and we'll keep researching and sharing what we got here on the pod, of course. Um, thanks for everyone for listening. And um, if you want us to cover anything, just let us know. Tell me if you like the slides Dave has. I love going into the market share. That was great research, Dave. Love to bring that to the table. Um, awesome stuff. And, you know, keep, keep on listening. Thanks. All right, John, safe travels. All we'll right. see you uh, next week at Supercomputing in All Atlanta. Right. <laughs> I mean, the, I think the title of this pod, Dave, is Tech Party Time, AWS Party Deep time. Dive. Reinvent's coming. Here we go. We didn't even talk about KubeCon this week. It looks like it's rocking out there in Utah with we'll our team. Next week. All right, see you later. All right, see you, bye.